I kept looking for lenses, and people would say, well, where's all the equipment? I want to demonstrate that actually the only piece of equipment it is is a piece of glass. David Hockney, our most celebrated living artist, reveals that 400 years before the invention of the photograph, artists were using simple cameras to capture stunningly realistic images on canvas. In a Hollywood studio, Hockney recreates masterpieces by Vermeer, Caravaggio and Van Eyck and demonstrates the secret techniques they use to create such vivid pictures. His extraordinary new evidence rewrites the story of some of the most famous paintings in the world. And the thrust looks good. All engines, all sources show the second stage is burning perfectly. Uh, Roger, Seven, you have a go. At least seven orbits. We thought we saw the 20th century on the news, film and elsewhere better than any previous century. Although we could say we did not see it at all, a camera did. Up to 160 years ago, all images were made by artists. Chemicals replaced them. Today, photographs monopolize reality and truth as painting did in the past. No electricity involved in this picture. It's done purely optically and very clear and very beautiful. If we think what is in front of a camera is truth, verisimilitude, then those who command control over optical imagery have great power. Look at film, this, the press and advertising. But the real news is the power of the photographic image, including this one you see in front of you, is coming to an end. Exciting times are ahead. Here we are in the Hollywood Hills. Below are the lights of Studio City. We're all hard at work here making pictures in studios. I've been designing my own kind of Hollywood set. Here it's representing Renaissance Florence, Bruges and Ghent. They look brand new as they did 600 years ago. Because this is a set in Hollywood, this is Hollywood, too. Florence, Bruges, Ghent, and Hollywood. Four cities deeply involved in picture making. They were secretive then, and they're secretive today. On this set, and in other real places, I'm going to make experiments that I hope will begin to reveal secrets of how these pictures were made over the last 600 years. Think of these words, real, natural, photographic, true to life, what do we mean when we use these words? Why does this Byzantine Christ look like this Van Gogh? This all started with a hunch. Ingres, the great 19th century French portrait painter, uh, he had a show at the National Gallery in London with drawings made of English tourists on the Grand Tour going to Rome. They are beautiful drawings of 
rather wonderful looking characters, rather grand, all putting on their best clothes. I saw these drawings and I was struck by how small they really were. Uh, very, very small indeed. Uh, the scale I would draw ahead, you, you kind of draw what you call sight size, which is bigger than these drawings. So I noticed this incredible accuracy about them, almost a, a photographic quality. I blew some of them up on a Xerox machine just to look at them a bit better. And I started to notice that the lines reminded me of Andy Warhol. He would project a photograph and trace the line. The line has a traced look. And to my surprise, some of these had a line similar to that. So I thought, well, 18, 12, how, how could they be done? And on a hunch, I thought, I wonder if he used a camera lucida. It's not that easy to use, a little tricky. And in effect, you get a, what looks like a projection onto the piece of paper, and you can also see your own hand. Nobody else sees this projection. It's actually an illusion. What you do first is look at the face very carefully, then decide what characteristics to measure. Do you see what I mean? Once then you look, so long as you've made some relationships, especially between the eyes, the nose and mouth, that's what you would set up. In my studio, we pinned up hundreds of colour photocopies of paintings. Paintings which seemed to have an optical look and paintings that did not. Slowly, we got a kind of order. I put Northern Europe at the top and Southern Europe at the bottom. The wall was necessary because I could then sit back and scan centuries of Western painting. We worked back further and further, and finally we got to a date where beyond that, it is very different. And that date is approximately 1420. That date is when a big change occurs. That's been observed by every art historian. The explanations for it are everybody could suddenly draw better. Uh, really? Uh, not that good an explanation, not that rational, really. So, we are focusing on this sudden change that happened. So what is an explanation? These faces are highly individualistic. They seem like very, very real people. These were unprecedented at the time. I mean, people came in to see these, uh, all admired them. They seemed vividly real. We can't appreciate really what that meant uh, today. I mean, uh, it would be, what would an equivalent be? I mean, some kind of... 3D effects in Disney World or something, you know. Um, there is very strong lighting on 
the faces generally. There is a very strong contrast. The strong contrast like that is really made with the sun. You're not getting a strong contrast on my face in here because the sun actually isn't beaming in. Sun on the face was the big clue. It is even more obvious in Northern Europe, Bruges and Ghent, individuals true to life and again brightly lit. Look at the deep shadows, small irises. They were sitting in very strong light, the sun. These paintings are all quite small, roughly the same size, about 30 centimeters across. It is strange that these artists are still referred to as Flemish primitives. But history places the dawn of the Renaissance in Florence, not here. Bruges and Ghent were very sophisticated new cities. The royal court and the church was almost as rich and powerful as in Florence. Both the church and the court commissioned paintings. Jan van Eyck was the court painter. He was not a humble craftsman. He ran a large workshop with many apprentices. He was an intellectual, a theologian, and a scientist. He is described by Vasari as an alchemist and credited with the invention of oil painting. Primitive? You are totally knocked out when looking at this picture. It's unbelievably rich in detail in every single part of it. The textures of cloth. The canon is holding a book with a kind of chamois leather that wraps the book. Amazing, the little figures behind are made of wood. Your eye can tell that, you can tell everything about the textures of the cloths, the incredible detail in the bishop's staff. Anything that's shiny, they seem to particular love. The armor is polished. All the gold thread in the bishop's coat. The shines look amazing. They look correct, as we'd say. You could almost say at times, they look almost like photographs. You could almost say that. It was that photographic look that I was beginning to see. I began to look at patterned fabrics. This is Masolino. Masaccio's teacher, 1425. He's made no attempt to describe the form under the fabric. The pattern is painted flat. Van Eyck's fabric, done 10 years later, is very different. See how beautifully the pattern follows the form. Absolutely believable on the surface. This is Bronzino, 1545. By now, a bold, elaborate fabric is following all the folds done very elaborately. Now, armor. The problem with shiny surfaces is when your eye moves, the shine moves. Pisanello, in 1450, did not even attempt the shine. He drew it by hand, so it has a handmade look. 
And then something happened. In this 1501 Giorgione, the shine here looks correct. By 1625, Van Dyck's armour with a delicate etched pattern could almost be a photograph. Fabrics and armour are very difficult to draw, but look at this chandelier in Van Eyck's Arnolfini wedding, painted in 1434. I've wondered most of my life how he painted this chandelier. In 1435, Alberti, in his book On Painting, described a method for drawing complex objects, a net, a grid of threads held in front of the subject. It's not that accurate and is difficult to use, and of course you have to look through a fixed point to see it. How would you do it? By eye. By two eyes. Anybody who knows the slightest thing about technical drawing, tracing, architectural drawing, engineering drawing, anything, will know that what I was trying to do on this piece of paper was conceptualize into two dimensions this fantastic, complicated, marvelous chandelier that appeared in a painting in 1430. I know that it is impossible for my two eyes here to make a drawing of that the way it appears in the painting. With a computer, you can turn the chandelier around. The very fact you can do this tells us that it is drawn in perfect perspective from a single point. And yet the methods for drawing something this complicated did not exist for at least another century. So how did artists in 15th century Bruges do it? Well, today they would have used a camera to take a photograph, a slide, project it onto the canvas, and then trace it. There are descriptions a hundred years after Van Eyck of dark rooms with a lens called a camera obscura, which simply means dark room. I kept looking for lenses, and people would say, well, where's all the equipment? What do you mean, a camera obscura? One of the problems with a camera obscura is it sounds like a piece of equipment. I want to demonstrate that actually the only piece of equipment it is is a piece of glass. In the 1700s, we know Canaletto used a camera obscura. Many artists did. This is by Reynolds. Reynolds certainly owned one. It's in the Science Museum in London. He obviously didn't tell everyone. <laughs> 
It folds up to look like a book. But in the paintings of Vermeer done in the 1600s, we see the most vivid use of optics. They have a photographic look. This basket is out of focus. The eye does not go out of focus. How did he paint this fabric and the map and this chandelier by eye? These paintings look strange to people at the time they were painted. The foreground objects seem too big, but not to us. We are used to looking at photographs. Professor Philip Stedman built this model not only from the painting, but from 17th century chairs, tiles, etc., that he went to great trouble to find and discovered that, viewed from one single point, the view of Vermeer's camera, a photograph of the set, matched the painting exactly. If you computerize Philip's model and project the scene through the lens, the image, focused on the back wall, is exactly the same size as the original canvas. In this model room, you can do the same with several other Vermeers. Only the people and the furniture change. The chance of this happening without optics is millions to one. You, you need quite a big lens because of the light. It, you're indoors and you need to see detail. And also, you need to project an image the size of the painting, which is, you know, this kind yeah. of size, so you need something that will project over that area. You don't need it all in focus at once, because, of course, you yeah. can refocus a bit. But I think that his lens was that kind of size, and that's the sort of lens you begin to get late 16th century, 17th century, early 17th century, for telescopes and big magnifying glasses people yeah. making them in Delft. So, um, I think artists had them first, actually. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, because images were more important, in a way. When we were constructing the wall, one picture we found was a... Uh, picture by Lorenzo Lotto, I think it's 1545, and there is an elaborate tablecloth. And we could notice at one point this tablecloth goes out of focus. We put it up on the wall because we felt this was quite a clue to something. Our eyes don't go out of focus. Doing it geometrically would see everything in focus. If you're working that out in linear perspective, everything is in focus. So I happened to show this to a new friend, Charles Falco. Um, he's a scientist, not in the arts at all. And next day, he faxed me, saying he'd been thinking about that painting and he realised there were some real clues in it. That particular painting probably had enough information in it for me to calculate the lens that had been used. Well, over the next couple of days, I made measurements on the painting, and there are several features in that lotto that are independent um, confirmation that a lens had been used. In fact, there's so much information in it, I was able to calculate the, the focal length and diameter of the lens to reasonable accuracy. What we seem to have found was Lotto's solution was using a lens causing a depth of field problem. When the focus moves from foreground to background, the scale changes. Placed together, the two halves will not match. Lotto had to paint the problem area out of focus. To the right-hand side of that Lotto, there's a very small but measurable change in the vanishing point at the same depth into the painting as the central feature where it goes out of focus. The laws of geometrical optics prove 
that Lotto used a lens. And so that's the thing that's different about this. If you understand the science, you realize that this isn't just a nice story. It's a scientific fact. This proof established an artist using a lens in the 1540s. The change we had seen on the wall, though, happened in Van Eyck's time, more than a century before. We were stuck. There was a huge weight of opinion that artists could not have used optics as early as this because glass was such poor quality that you could not make a good lens. During the course of conversations and in discussions, I happened to mention that, well, of course, a curved mirror also is a lens. And this was a sort of statement that a scientist regard this as obvious. A physical scientist knows this, that a curved mirror, like a simple shaving mirror or a makeup mirror in the bathroom, forms an image or can be used to form an image. And David didn't know this. There's no doubt they had mirrors. I mean, they had convex mirrors. If they had convex mirrors, it's absurd to say they didn't have concave mirrors. It's actually just a piece of glass the other side. Remember, the great image makers, Van Eyck and so on, again, are going to have whatever latest equipment is available, like uh, Hollywood will or anywhere will. Concave mirrors have been known since antiquity. They were called burning mirrors. Archimedes was thought to have used burning mirrors to burn the Roman fleet that was trying to sack Syracuse around 0 BC. Well, at the same time you're focusing the sun's rays, you're also forming an image. Now, under normal circumstances, you don't notice the image because the bright glare from the, the bright sunlight that's focused washes out the image. So it's inconceivable to me that somebody in the right circumstances didn't see an image. And it's obvious to me that Van Eyck saw those images, and the difference between them and others over the thousand years before is they were smart enough to know how to make use of it. Well, here we have a marvelous color projection of the tower. You can see the uh, ivy is blowing in the wind. It's moving. Very beautiful color. This is done with a very simple mirror. And in 600 years ago in Bruges, uh, they were making mirrors. And in the Guild of St. Luke, which was for the painters, they also had the mirror makers. They were part of the same guild. If you want a good image, you have to take some trouble and think of where the sun is and think of all that kind of thing just like a photographer, carefully thinking about where the light is and so on and so on. Anybody can do it for themselves and see this happen. And it was a surprise to me, a great surprise to everybody else who showed it to. We realised no art historian knew this. Nobody we knew knew it. And it was a pivotal moment for us finding it. Then finding the size, the size of the sweet spot is uh, 30 centimeters square. That's about the size of the Doge by Bellini. That's the size of the Robert Campion head. This is the size of enormous numbers of early Netherlands portraits. Is that a coincidence? No. I think they found a very, very useful tool which they kept to themselves as they would. Van Eyck never wrote down any formulas whatsoever for the marvelous glazes he was using. They were not written down, probably in case somebody else got them who he didn't want to have them, who was a rival. Uh, meaning they were in business and he needed other things. So he's not going to tell them uh, exactly uh, how he does things. When we made the first image with the mirror, it was deeply exciting. I knew we'd discovered something rather big. We were setting up a still life based on the Kotan painting of the cabbage on the string. And unfortunately, the cabbage started spinning round. It didn't stay still. 
But I went into the dark room to see it, but there on the projection was the cabbage spinning. And I realised this is a colour movie. It moves. I mean, there it is. It's spinning. It's quite beautiful. Of course, it's upside down. The string's coming from the bottom. And I then realised, my God, this is a, this is a movie in colour. They must have seen it 600 years ago. And actually, there's a straight line from this to the television picture of today. And it goes all the way through European painting. Uh, that dawned on me. I think nobody's observed that before. But it has to be true, actually. You could have a string grid here and so on. All that's possible, but so is the mirror. Now, if you've got one or the other, which are you going to use? One is simpler, clearer, cleaner for the drawing. That's it. I mean, this is a, a question if we can see the possible techniques. You pick the simplest one, the one that will produce the best results. And frankly, that's what we're just finding. Let's have a look. Uh, just knock that off a minute. Just, go, just measure half, not David. If... Uh, it's not lit, it's not properly lit. We're getting near. Wait a minute, yeah. We're getting near. We're getting near. Wait a minute. Go back further, Stan. It's a bit bigger. Go, can you go back further? And as you go back further, I think we get more in focus. Do you see? Do, yeah. Yes. This projection is now about the, exactly the size of the chandelier in the painting. This is approximately eight inches across. It is precisely the size. The mirror making this projection is a, about five inches across. It is small, and it is very sharp, it is very clear. Uh, uh, the sun would be uh, giving this light, but you could see how this incredibly difficult perspective, if it had to be drawn mathematically, how difficult it is, I'm just doing this very crude, but you can see the highlights, very similar to uh, in the painting. You see, I'm just measuring little things. It will be extremely difficult to get these shapes, negative shapes, positive shapes, but here you can see it. The curve at the top is precisely uh, how it is in the painting, these curves. Um, if you... Uh, you can't see what I've done, but if you take a candle and then I cover up the mirror, uh, you can see uh, I'm beginning... I could plan the curves. They're rather crude. I'm doing them quickly. But you can see it opens the process. It opens the method of doing it now you take the candle away, take the hand from the mirror, it comes back. This is very, very, very strong evidence. And I'll repeat now, I think, to look for evidence of lenses and mirrors, you look at pictures. Pictures give you evidence because lenses and mirrors make pictures. All the questions about where is the equipment, seemed to fall away. But something else was happening at this time in Florence, the defining moment of Western image making, Brunelleschi's invention of perspective. Perspective is an abstraction, a device for putting what we see in three dimensions onto a two-dimensional surface. It gives us an illusion of space.
Things are scaled as they appear to the eye from a single point, larger at the front and smaller at the back. Brunelleschi famously made a painting of the baptistry that astonished Florence. Made sometime before 1412, it was, suspiciously, 30 centimetres square. I was taught it was based on abstract geometry. But how was it conceived? Did he see something first? We went to Florence to do an experiment in the precise position where we know Brunelleschi painted his picture. Three braccia, that is about two metres, inside the doorway of Florence Cathedral. Early in the morning the sun is on the baptistry, but inside it is very dark. It is a camera. Brunelleschi stood in this doorway, supposedly about six, seven feet in the door, and uh, made a panel of the baptistry. And uh, we think he did it. He made a perspective picture. We know that. The mirror makes a perspective picture. Uh, Brunelleschi was the man in charge of every tool there was in Florence. He's building a dome on the cathedral. Every bit of latest technology was there. The descriptions of the pulley system, uh, they described to, for him to pull things up. It's therefore, it seems to me, not possible that he didn't know the mirror would do what we did in Florence. Brunelleschi had to have known. It's not possible we were the first people to do that. Using the mirror, he could only produce a small picture, about 30 centimeters square. But by extending these lines of perspective, he could create what all artists wanted, a bigger space and a bigger picture. That way, of course, makes you one fixed point out here. That's what it would do, and a mathematical point at that. Somehow, they never did that in Bruges. In Bruges, it would seem to me, if their picture is this size because of optical projections and he wanted to make them bigger. They somehow add like this because it has an effect of making you close to everything. This is the Last Supper by Dirk Boots. It has a kind of perspective. Things are bigger at the front and smaller at the back, but not precisely scaled as in Italian paintings. Parallel lines do not all meet at one point. It's a collage of separate mirror lens views, each one precise, accurate and optical. The reason, perhaps, I was able to see this is that I had done something very similar myself. I made my Polaroid pictures because I was dissatisfied with the limitations of the single photograph and wanted to make a bigger picture. Each individual Polaroid is precise, accurate, optical. You get a different kind of space. And yet, to me, it's closer to how we really see, with two eyes and the eye being part of the mind. You could call it a wonky perspective. Like us, we're wonky. 
for myself. I prefer, actually, the spaces made here because I feel you are a person who's in them, like I am in the world. I'm not outside the world looking in through a window. I'm in it. Uh, we should all feel we're in it. Everybody flocks to Florence for inspiration. When you go to Calais, you drive off quick and often bypass Bruges and Ghent. But perhaps we should stop here because there's a marvellous example of a picture that makes us feel a part of the world. Van Eyck's masterpiece, the altarpiece in Ghent. This is the very, very sophisticated picture. Amazing power when you come in this room. The central panel of this is uh, a quite remarkable space where you seem, even in the middle distance, the crowds in the middle distance, you can see every detail in the hat, the jewels in the archbishop's hats and so on. Wonderful foliage. Marvellous green. The green and red together give it this incredible depth, more than practically any other painting I know, in a way. I've just put together a reproduction of a desert high road I'd done 16 years ago, and I put it next to the centre panel here. And I immediately saw there must be similar principles at work here. In the Pair of Highway, it looks as though you're stood outside the picture at first. So you don't remain outside very long because actually I was never stood outside any area. You were close to everything. Uh, a stop sign, I was up a ladder doing it. You were close to it. Somehow Van Eyck was close to everything here until you get to the way the far distance. But the groups in the uh, front, you feel close to them. You see wonderful detail, meaning you have to be close to see that detail. Uh, you see it in the middle distance as well. And I remember walking about this thing. I was not stood in one, yet I made a still picture. This is a still picture, but it's a moving picture in your head, actually. Concave mirrors were used by artists for about a century. But then a superior technology came along, the lens, which is much more versatile. The projections now can be almost any size you want. They can be life-size, they can be tiny, they can be anything. With the mirror lens, that's not true. You see, it's a certain scale. It's that scale of the Netherlands portraits. So obviously, once you got this superior piece of equipment, you don't bother with the other. This is Sick Bacchus by Caravaggio, painted in 1594. To me, this seems to have been done with the concave mirror because he's constructed in sections like the Flemish paintings. Now look at this one painted a year later. The space is quite different. Look at them together. The one on the left is much closer to you. It seems more like the Flemish painting. The one on the right is set back further, more like a photograph. These two paintings, it seems to me, show the move from mirror lens to lens.
Okay, Rich, pick up the glass of wine. Pull it back to you a bit more. Hold it there. Okay, rest it. Put it down. Now pick it up again, and I'll tell you exactly where to put it. No, down a bit. Down a little bit. OK. That's how, if he rested, you'd get it back. And Caravaggio did make marks like that in the paint. But there was a slight technical hitch using a lens. Unlike the mirror lens, the picture is reversed. He picked it up, of course, with his uh, right hand, but here it looks as though his, his left hand, uh, because this is a straight projection, um, not using a mirror to reverse it again. Uh, everything is reversed now. Once I realised this, I started to notice a large number of left-handed drinkers, never seen in Giotto, by the way. When you reverse the paintings, the amazing thing is they look more harmonious and natural. In this painting of 1660 from the Franz Hals Museum, everyone is left-handed including the man pointing at them. Try that with your hands. The chances of finding three left-handed people and, look, a left-handed monkey seem to be remote. Eventually, artists found a simple remedy to this problem. Bounce the image from the lens onto your canvas with a flat mirror. Of course, this is another piece of equipment and very expensive. Pick the wine glass up, Rich. He now picks it up with his right hand. Because we, the mirror, flat mirror, is reflecting the image through the lens. Beautiful. Beautiful. Highlights in the eyes. Gorgeous, yeah. Once you begin to see the optical base, you notice other strange things. Parmigianino's lady has a massive right shoulder. In Van Dyke's Genovese lady, if she stood up, she'd be 12 foot tall. The peasant wife by Georges de la Tour has legs out of proportion to her body. She seems to be on stilts. This is what can have happened to Georges de la Tour. We get the projection like this, and you get very clear, let's get the face in focus. You get the face in focus, so you get the points where things would be. The hands are in focus. Then 
to make this dress in focus at the feet, you see you're moving it. You see how she's been lengthened. As you can see, when you tilt things, things squeeze up. And that is what is happening. That is why we get what we call these kind of optical distortions. You see, it's a very simple way the lens can move. It just tilts that way or that way. You can also actually tilt this way and this way. It's now going out of focus. As I'm tilting the lens, it would focus something else. From about 1500 to about 1860, you never see a badly done basket. They always get the weave in the right place. The projection itself here is just simply ravishingly beautiful. The different tones of greys that are set up here, tiny highlights you can see. If I'm looking at it three-dimensionally, they're quite hard to see uh, exactly where they are, because if you move as well, the shine changes. Here it does not. It will not change. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Techniques of using the lens, of course, varied enormously. The work doesn't have to look like a photograph. Franz Hals, for example, never made a drawing. There's no known drawing by him. He worked straight onto the canvas with very loose brushwork, yet the underlying precision is uncanny. Almost no drawings survived from Velasquez either. He didn't seem to make many. I always wondered how did he paint that silk so perfectly, so fast? Well, I'm only pointing out here, say, this red satin. Now, of course, uh, this isn't the real Pope. This is a Hollywood Pope. And actually, this is a bit of Hollywood uh, silk. So it's not quite uh, doing the things that the real Pope would. But nevertheless, you can see that on this flat surface, the whole of these subtle reds, how few there are actually, and how that shine is in a right place. That a few brush marks by a very clever painter could capture very quickly, just as Velasquez's brush marks are fast. They are made fast, like that. I'm just making the point that on the flat surface, as you can see, the folds uh, and subtleties of highlight are all here. Absolutely, and very beautiful. Absolutely very beautiful to look at. The Pope was certainly there for painting the head, but not necessarily for the robe. A mannequin could have been used. This is a reconstruction of Caravaggio's lute player. Once you see a projection like this, you fall in love with its magic, capturing the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional surface. For an artist to see it is to use it. They would have been thrilled. Of course, that not all artists would have used optics directly, but once one did, others would see the result and be influenced by the look we still are. The mirror lens seemed to be used for drawing first and then painting. But how can you use a lens 
to tell a story. The master of setting this scene seems to be Caravaggio. Let's look at the card sharks by Caravaggio. It's a story about deceit. There are three brightly lit figures in the painting, but he's used one model twice. The space between the characters is quite shallow and they appear pressed together. And the standing man is surely meant to be looking over the boy's shoulder at his hand of cards. But there seems to be some confusion. He's actually looking at the back of the boy's head. Many people have suggested he was like a film director. And now, as a description, it seems not far from the truth. OK, how we, we, tell me when I, I want to start soon, cos he's very hot. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Yeah. And the face is good. We're going to start. Sorry, you can't hear. Keep looking up, Rich. Okay. And we're going to start. Right. Stay still. The first problem is a lens can only project one model at a time. In fact, the lens has a hot spot in the middle, so Caravaggio would have to find a way of dealing with this. He would work out where in the composition the projection is required. You can move in one minute. Wait a minute. Rich, uh, you can move away in... Now, actually. Go on, you can move away. Okay, now, I want to do his hand. Another essential is to decide where to focus the lens. I'm having to reposition the cameras to get his hand in focus. Don't forget, we saw this happening in the Lotto painting. Changing focus changes scale. You can see that quite clearly in Caravaggio's Supper at Emmaus of 1601. This hand here is bigger than the bowl of fruit. He's going to be here. That's it. Gonna be That's like it. This. Now we've got a rough position for the first character, we need to set up the position for the second character. I'll be using the same model, like Caravaggio, but while the model is changing, I'm using a standing to set up the position as you would in a movie studio. Also note, it is the canvas that has moved position. The model is going to sit in the same position as the first model. They all sit in the same space. Hence the problem of space. Very good, yeah. Now the hand's about there. That's it. Now, wait a minute. Uh, put your hands round the cards better. You see? Very good. And look at the cards rather innocently. Yeah, very good. Uh, I just can't see his face very good. Uh, that's it. Yes. Better. Now, just turn, looking at the...
card. Are you looking at the cards, Rich? Yeah? Let's start. Have a look now. <coughs> Let's do the other. Okay, you can move. And now we want. Uh, I wanted to raise his right hand. Yeah? Uh, He's now to be looking back here, looking back here, looking over there. Next, the last figure. What I'm trying to do is position his head so his eyes are looking at the cards. But as with Caravaggio, the whole process is very difficult because the model is looking at something that is not there. You see this in movies too. When actors are filmed in close-up, it's usually done separately, so they have no fixed position to look at, and it's very easy to get the eye line wrong. You can see this in other paintings. Doubting Thomas, for instance, looks past his finger. This is hard. This is very hard. I can't see. Um... Okay, wait a minute, just leave it there. Okay, stay still, please, Michael. Uh, I'm going to stop. Uh, well, you move, Michael. I'm going to have to have a look at it. I'm not showing her. This is very hard. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look at it, actually. <laughs> Bob? Yeah. Of course, I knew about the problems afterwards and we're still having problems of eye line scale and so on but i should think caravaggio was so thrilled with the image he wouldn't have noticed everybody is thrilled with new technology at first it's only later that you notice the limitations but his eyes are in the real painting are looking behind actually uh, he did them like that, didn't he? Optics. I was going to say, do not make marks. Don't. The Sean did. 
my English school teacher mentality. Do not make optics. Do not make marks. Um, uh, I made the marks. The optics made a picture there, but that picture is ephemeral. Remember, until until 1839, and chemicals could uh, freeze it, as it were. Uh, these images were there, but they were ephemeral, uh, meaning they'd be gone. The only record made is some artists doing that. The artist paints the pictures, and it is his painting skills that count. The hand is in control even when it is inside the camera. And then in 1839, chemical photography was invented by Daguerre in France and Fox Talbot in England almost at the same time. Photography is usually seen as the start of something, but it is in fact the end of something. The artist's hand in the camera was replaced by chemicals. After the invention of photography, painters no longer had a monopoly on images you could call real, natural, true to life. So artists began to look elsewhere for other ways of depicting reality. This 1889 Van Gogh is not considered real like a photograph. It's a reaction against the photograph. Nor is this Byzantine Christ considered true to life. It's done before artists discovered optics could be used to make pictures. Before and after, very similar. Awkwardness returned to painting about 1870. An avant-garde emerged. They wanted to find fresh ways of depicting the world. Cezanne doubts the position of things. He is using two eyes. It's more human. Cubism in the early 20th century combines multiple viewpoints. But in the end, the single viewpoint, the frozen moment, triumphed. With the advent of film and television, the tyranny of the lens was complete. With a moving image, it's almost impossible to have more than one viewpoint. But we are now at the end of chemical photography. A new tool has arrived, the computer. The computer allows us to manipulate images. Manipulate means to use the hand, the hand is back in the camera. Chemical photography only lasted about 170 years. Look carefully at this painting by Bouguereau, painted in 1896. Art history says Cezanne triumphed over this kind of painting, a kind of which he thought was dishonest madness. But the problem is, Bouguereau is closer to what we are seeing today. In the 1890s, Bouguereau was probably projecting photographs to make this. You can see quite clearly the girl is lying on a table, oblivious to the wave about to crash over her. It's really an absurd picture. All he did was put in a back projection. He could have placed her anywhere just as you do on the computer today. We 
We seem to live in an arrogant age. In fact, the idea that there is not much to learn from the past is rather disturbing. In some ways, we might say we do know more, but we seem to have forgotten some things that they knew in the past. You could say we still live in a perspective nightmare. The single point of view will always restrict our perceptions. There seems to me a great, big, beautiful world out there, and we are hemmed in. Don't you want to get out to see a bigger space, a bigger picture? I think we do. Exciting times could be ahead.